Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Thank you for tuning in. This week's video, I wanna discuss EV vehicles and the move to producing less greenhouse gases around the world. Now, let's be honest, it's not exactly a bad thing. I mean, we all have one world that we're living in and might as well do the best to protect it for us in future generations. However, I have a couple issues with the EV movement. The first is what would appear to be the government's extreme push into forcing us into electric vehicles without any real understanding of what they do to the environment. The other problem I have is that in that push, it seems like what they're trying to do is make it so it's financially impossible to run a petrol engine and we're going to be forced into all buying EVs. Now, I was discussing this with a group of friends and we were all kind of talking about how, you know, the $6 a gallon thing really kind of sucks in California. At which point the EV owner in the group pipes up with the statement of, well, if you can't afford the gas, it's time to buy an EV. And I had to stop and think about that for a second. To me, that's probably one of the most insensitive comments I've ever heard come out of a liberal. Because if you look at it, those of us who are buying cars like the GTR or the BRZs or whatever high performance car, yeah, $6 a gallon really kind of sucks, but we can make it work. We're still paying our rent, we're still eating, and we're gonna make things work. So who does this gas hike affect? And that is the low income families that are just trying to make it through the month. Those families will typically buy a car for about $800 to $1,000 and hope it works for a year or two before they have to buy another. And they're sitting there trying to figure out how they're gonna make rent, how they're gonna put food on the table for their kids. For them, $6 a gallon, which is what we're paying here in California, is absolutely detrimental to their monthly budget. So how do you expect a family like that to scrape together the 40,000 or more to buy an electric vehicle? It just can't be done. So those of us that are able to afford cars like this, we're fine, but those lower income families are really struggling. So I had to stop and think this week, you know, what would be a better solution? How can we reduce our greenhouse gases and how can we also make it cost effective for families that are struggling? And I think I may have come up with an answer and it's, actually one that those of us who drive cars like this would like to see happen anyways. And that is, I think we should st stop maybe moving so hard for EVs and maybe start pushing people to convert to E85. So in this video, what I'm gonna discuss is E85 and how it compares to electric vehicles when it comes to carbon footprints. Before I start talking about the differences in the carbon footprints between EV vehicles and E85, I first want to talk about the economics for the consumer. Seems how that's really the idea that set me down this path that has now led me to about a week and a half's worth of research to get to this point in the video. And pretty much it comes down to this. As I said in the beginning, to get families to switch to EV vehicles, they're still relatively new and it doesn't have a huge used market. And certain companies, <coughs> Tesla, control their used market. They don't want people selling private party which means it's very hard and very expensive for a family to adopt into an EV situation, especially when you have two or three licensed drivers in the household. However, when you took a look at converting to E85, is only a fraction of the cost. For those of you that have done E85 on your GTRs or whatever car you're driving, you know it's not a terribly expensive endeavor. Pretty much you're just looking at fuel pumps, injectors, and some sort of fuel tuning software and an E85 sensor. Now, let's kind of step that up a little bit to an everyday family that might be driving something, you know, like a Camry. It's going to take a little bit more. I mean, still, the fuel pump is not going to be expensive. You know, you can get E85 compatible fuel pumps for like two, three hundred bucks. They're not buying 1,000 cc injectors. They're just buying stock style injectors, which means, what, another 500, 600 bucks at most. What we don't know is the cost for the lines. You know, you're going to have to start releasing lines that are E85 compatible, as well as fuel filters, and then my guess would be that if this becomes some sort of mandate where the government says, hey, we have to get off petroleum, we're all going to get onto E85, that car companies are going to have to release uh, some sort of chip that maybe plugs into the OBD2 port that helps the car become a flex fuel car. Now, the reason why I know this will work is countries like Brazil have been running E100 for decades. In fact, that's all you can get in Brazil. They all run pure E100. There's no gasoline in that country, really. So I know it's feasible. But when you take a look at, let's assume you even have a mechanic that has to do the conversion. You're looking at maybe a max of $5,000 at most. Although that's still a lot of money, it's still a much lower barrier to entry than $45,000 for a brand new car. Moving on from just the 
barrier to entry when it comes to the cost of buying electric vehicles versus converting to 85. I also want to talk about feasibility. I mean, how difficult is it going to be to convert an entire country to one of these two alternative fuel sources for our vehicles? First, I want to look at EVs because we're having to deal with it right now. And there's actually already an issue. According to the Alternative Fuel Data Center, by next year, the grid nationwide is only going to be strong enough to be able to support 73% of the light consumer vehicles that will be on the road. So as you can see, we're going to have a bigger demand than we have a supply, and that's going to create issues. In fact, here in Southern California, we already have an issue with electricity even before we had EVs on the road. During the summer, as you know, it gets hot here, sometimes getting into about 100 to 120. And when everyone starts running their air conditioning to keep their buildings cool, we get rolling brownouts. It's just something that we've dealt with for a long time. Now imagine the issues that are gonna pop up when all of a sudden you put 3.5 million cars on the grid at the exact same time. Now people that are for EV vehicles are gonna say, well, as we put more EVs on the grid, it's gonna be forced to evolve and get better to support it. Well, it's a great idea in theory, but as we've seen, the technology just isn't there yet. We would have to completely revamp our power supply issue as well as our power distribution. Now, I'm sure a lot of you probably haven't thought about this, but you really don't have an electric station across the street from your house. In most cases, wherever you live, whichever plant is supplying your electricity is hundreds of miles away, and the electricity has to be converted and amped up to make it down the lines to make it to your house. It's a very inefficient system. So in that, we're gonna be taxing a grid that's already overloaded. It's gonna create issues and it's gonna take many, many years before we're able to figure out a way to update it to accommodate all the extra requirements. However, when you take a look at E85, well, that system's already kind of in place because you can actually go to some gas stations and find E85. Plus, there's the added bonus that we will be supporting local farmers. That's right, not only does electric vehicles and E85 get us off of our dependency on foreign oil, by switching to E85, we're supporting our own local economy. Now, I know what's coming up because my dad works in agriculture, so I'm aware of this. Basically, the government subsidizes our corn farmers to destroy part of their crop every year to keep the value of corn from dropping too low in the grocery stores. That means that there is a surplus of corn being grown that's being destroyed just to keep a certain price point. Imagine if we took all that corn that's being destroyed and just turned it into E85 fuel. We already have the supply to handle the demand. So in that, converting to E85 is way more feasible than forcing an entire country to convert to electric vehicles. So now that we've seen that it's actually more economical to convert to E85 than going to EV and it's even more feasible, you may be starting to wonder now, well, okay, is it better for the planet? And I'm gonna go ahead and cheat during this one because I have a whole bunch of notes because I did a lot of research over the last week and a half to discover, I'm gonna go ahead and give you the answer right now, that actually switching to E85 actually reduces the amount of greenhouse gases even over electric vehicles. It's better for the environment than switching to electric vehicles for numerous reasons. First of it is, the actual emissions from the tailpipe. Now, I know a lot of people out there with electric cars are saying like, well, my car's got no emissions. And you see those bumper stickers and those license plate frames that say zero emissions. And that's just a big misconception or a flat out lie. Now, yes, there's no emissions coming out of the tailpipe, but as you know, electricity has to come from somewhere. It doesn't just appear by magic in the car every morning when you get in and that is gonna come from an electric power plant. Now, the people that are running these EV vehicles are saying like, well, you know, we've got all this solar and hydroelectric and all this other stuff, so it's not really as bad as you think. That's actually not true. Uh, according to the US Department of Energy and, and the US Energy Information Administration, only 20% of electricity uh, comes from renewable sources like wind, hydro, solar, or geothermal. The rest all come from natural gas, nuclear, coal, and petroleum. 
So the difference is, instead of seeing the exhaust gases coming out of your tailpipe, they're coming out of a factory hundreds of miles away from where you live. Now this also creates a different issue in that, as you know, I've got to take this car in to smog every year to make sure it's within a specific specification. Those coal burning, fossil fuel burning, nuclear power plants, they have a much wider range of the amount of CO2 and greenhouse gases they're allowed to pump into the atmosphere every year. So even though you may basically walk out to your car and think you're putting less contaminants into the air than I am, you're actually putting more. Now at this point, I'm sure proponents of EVs are saying, well, those are just the numbers right now. As the world converts to electric vehicles, the electric grid is gonna be forced to evolve and become more green and supply more power. We'll start using you know, solar power more or hydroelectric or other clean resources. And in that, it'll be better for the environment. And to be honest, they may be right. I really didn't do the research on that. But I can tell you, we are a long way off from going to fully green, sustainable electricity production, at least here in the US. However, even once we reach that state, there's another issue, and it's actually the production of the vehicles. When you take a look at actually building an electric vehicle versus even building a normal car, E85 is still the cleaner way to go. There was a committee that was created called the Transport and Environment Committee, and this was a worldwide committee that was brought together to take a look at the ramifications of electrical vehicles and how they affected the environment. And when they take a look at the building of electric vehicles, you have to use lithium to create the batteries. And this committee discovered that lithium mining releases 196 kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Now to put things in perspective, that committee also took a look at the creation and maintenance of a diesel car that gets five liters per 100 kilometers. So when you take a look at the starting of the production all the way through driving, they found that the diesel car could be built and driven 89,400 kilometers before the electric vehicle even drove one meter to have the exact same carbon footprint. That's right, you could drive a diesel car almost 90,000 miles and have the same carbon footprint as an EV that's on the showroom that hasn't been driven at all. Now, the Transport and Environment Committee wasn't the only one to take a look at this. MIT also released a paper where they discovered that the creation of one Tesla Model 3 battery releases 15,680 kilograms of CO2 into the atmosphere. So in that, converting us to E85 because the cars are already on the road and don't need to be built, or they can just be built and they take a lot less damage to the environment is way more eco-friendly than running an electric vehicle. Now this extra piece here is something that I did a few years ago when I was working on getting a degree in mechanical engineering. I did a thesis paper on alternative fuel sources and I discovered that the lithium mines when they're done have become so toxic that not even bacteria will grow there. In fact there was a lithium mine up in Canada that is just so devoid of life that NASA uses it to test their lunar rovers because that is the closest thing to the moon's environment you can get on the planet Earth. Of course, at this point, you might be wondering then, well, how much CO2 and greenhouse gases are released when converting corn to E85? I mean, farmers are using tractors that are running on diesel and it has to be trucked to whatever facility is used to refine it down to the E85. Now, that was actually answered by the Argonne National Laboratory, which seems to be a laboratory that a lot of papers reference back to to get their numbers. And they actually found that corn-based ethanol in place of electric production sees a reduction of greenhouse gases by 40% and a reduction of 88 to 108% over the course of the entire production. So what they're saying is that to refine the corn into E85 is actually 40% cleaner than basically running the electric grid. And then they're saying when you account for the, the building and the creation of the batteries and the cars, that there's actually a reduction of 88 to 108% of greenhouse gases versus electric vehicles. 
At this point, you might be thinking, wow, E85 sounds way better for the environment and way cheaper than going with an electric vehicle. But there's gotta be some downsides, right? Like E85 can't be this absolute miracle cure and for some reason nobody's using it. And here's where I'm gonna be honest. Yeah, there are about two downsides to running E85. But I'm gonna be honest, to me, they're actually not so bad that it actually would turn me off to suggesting that we convert to E85 over electric vehicles. The first issue you're gonna have with E85 is it doesn't get very good miles per gallon. When you take a look at like the R35 GTR, I'm running regular gas and I'm getting about 20 miles per gallon. However, my buddies that are running E85 and their R35, they seem to find that they're getting about 10 to 12 miles per gallon. So there is a drop in the miles you're gonna be able to go on a tank. However, don't let that completely dissuade you because uh, given the current prices, they're still spending less money than me. When you take a look at our current prices here in LA, I'm spending anywhere from $6.20 to $6.50 a gallon for Supreme. Where my buddies that are running E85, they're spending anywhere from $2.85 to $3 a gallon. So when you do the math, they're actually saving 60 cents a mile running E85 than I'm spending. The only difference is they have to go to the pump more often than I do. So like I said, yeah, there is a downside that you are getting less mile per gallon, but you are saving more money. And that might also only be a temporary issue. According to Uppsala University, which is a Scandinavian university that was doing a study on E85, they found that the data suggests that the miles per gallon for E85 will double by 2055. And to me, that makes perfect sense because when I think back to the old classic cars like the Camaros and the Mustangs, I had a 69 Camaro back in the day. I was getting about eight miles per gallon. Now, when you compare that to the 2010 Camaro I had, I was getting about 20 to 22 miles per gallon. So as technology evolves, E85 may actually start to catch up in your miles per gallon with actual petrol. The other issue that you're gonna have with E85 is it does have a higher ignition point. So it does have issues in colder environments. If you have E85 in your car, or if you've seen videos of people doing cold starts on E85, you'll notice that they have to turn the car over longer to get it to actually catch fire and run. Now this becomes an even bigger issue when you're in a colder environment, because like I said, it has a higher ignition point. So in colder environments, it takes even longer to start and people who live in places like, I don't know, Wisconsin or Canada or Alaska, during the winter, they might have issues where their E85 car may not want to fire. But that's where, you know, flex fuel can come in and you can maybe run in some petrol to kind of make it a little bit better. Or, you know, as we've seen that the uh, miles per gallon will increase as technology increases. If we see a widespread adoption of E85, technology may catch up to the point that they might figure out a way to get E85 to fire in colder environments. But with all that said, I can definitely say that it seems like E85 is just a better way to go. And there it is. Those are the reasons why I believe this country would be far better pushing for conversion to E85 over this push for putting us all in electric vehicles. It's cheaper for the consumer, it's better for the environment, and the infrastructure is already in place to make it work. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, go hit that thumbs up button to let me know. It does help the channel out a lot. If you'd like to see more automotive, particularly GTR content in the future, go and subscribe to the channel. You can also follow me on all forms of social media, which include Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. I'll leave links to all those in the description down below. If you'd like to support the channel, I do have the JD Archer shop. If you go to jdarcher.bigcartel.com, you can see a limited section of hats and t-shirts that I've designed that are for sale. Now, after watching this video, if you have any questions, comments, or you have a really good reason why electric is better than E85, go ahead and post in the comment section down below. I will respond to you. I thank you all for watching and until next time, forget everything else, focus on the finish line.